Welcome to our Family Bible Hour this morning. And this is February the 28th, and we are so happy, I think we're all really happy, that this is the last Sunday we're going to have to record these for what we hope is a very, very long time, as we'll be meeting in person next Sunday to have a live meeting, which is very, very exciting. Very much looking forward to that. So next Sunday, I hope you can make it in person to be here as we will have the Lord's Supper and finally Bible hour and prayer time at the beginning. And so we look forward to that. So we're going to start off today with some singing. And this is a good old favorite song, When We All Get to Heaven. Father, we give you thanks for this wonderful hope that we have that when we all get to heaven, we'll see the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're looking forward to that day when he will either come back to take us home or we will go to be with him. And we just pray that we will live every day in the light of the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ could come back any day or we could go to be with him at any time. And so we just pray that you will help us to live a life that is honoring to the Lord Jesus Christ. We just pray for our morning and for the music and for the speaker. We just pray that you'll bless our time. In Jesus' name, amen. So like I said, we will be meeting next Sunday here at the chapel. And so an email will be going out uh, for you to sign up. So if you can make it, which we hope you can, uh, please sign up before you come. And uh, we'll look forward to a good time. Today we're going to have Scott Duncan. He's going to be sharing the word with us in just a few minutes. And next Sunday, Ryan Nicholson will be here at the chapel to share the word of God. And don't forget the Tuesday night study and the Wednesday night study. The Tuesday study will be here at the chapel. And the Wednesday study will be on Zoom. And so we look forward to those things. Our next song is going to be a favorite of Ben Andrus. And uh, I loved when, for all, a lot, many times that he would song lead, he would give this song out. I sing the mighty power of God. It's one of my favorites. And so, Ben, we hope you enjoy this song.
final spring will come. The Lord is my salvation. In times of waiting, times of need, when I know loss, when I am weak, I know His grace. Simplicity, longing for purity, to worship you in spirit and truth, only you. Lord, strip it all away, till only you remain. I'm coming back to my first love. You're the reason I sing, the reason I sing. Yes, my heart will sing how I love you. And forever I'll sing, forever I'll sing. Yes, my heart will sing how I love you. With my broken song to you, the perfect one, to worship you in spirit and truth, only you. Give me a childlike heart, lead me to where you are. I'm coming back to my first love, only you. You're the reason I sing, the reason I sing. Yes, my heart will sing how I love you. And forever I'll sing, forever I'll sing. Yes, my heart will sing 
Yes, my heart will sing how I love you. Thank you for joining us this morning and singing along. And we'll now have a message from our brother, Scott Duncan. Well, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Scott Duncan. Um, down here at Oxford, PA. Uh, I'm recording for those of you there in uh, St. Catharines uh, area. Um, and uh, happy to be with you, even though this is via recording. But uh, hopefully at some point in the future, I can be uh, with you all in person. Uh, but in the meantime, for tonight, uh, I've been privileged to uh, share something from the Word of God and trust that it will be encouraging to all that are listening. And um, <clears throat> I thought maybe we can begin in the book of Exodus and uh, chapter 34, Exodus chapter 34. And um, before we uh, begin reading this, let's ask the Lord's uh, blessing upon this time. Father, again, we're just so thankful when, when we think of um, who you are and your goodness to us, Lord, and that we can have a real relationship with the real God through your son, the Lord Jesus. And we are privileged people, those of us who know you, Lord. And we, we pray that <clears throat> the time spent in your word tonight and the thoughts that uh, are given um, based on your word are truly uh, being led by your spirit. And that your spirit would be evident here uh, during this session. Uh, and that your spirit might help guide and direct our thoughts to think even more highly of the Lord Jesus and all that he is and what he's done. So again, Father, we ask for your help right now by your spirit. And it's in your son's name we pray and give thanks to the Lord Jesus. Amen. So, um, more recently, I have been thinking of uh, just the character of God, what he's like, and um, what he can mean to us. And, um, you know, in the world today, there's, in my eyes, at least two really main questions. Uh, number one is, is there a God? And number two is, if there is a God, what is that God like? And again, if you know the Lord Jesus, you do know what that God's like. And and you're getting to know him more and more as time goes on. And, um, <clears throat> and God loves to reveal himself to us. And one of the passages we're going to look at tonight is a very famous passage. Well, probably all the, all the passages we'll look at tonight are very famous. But um, uh, this one in particular, uh, we're going to get uh, uh, a view of God's opinion of himself. And what he has to say about himself as as in this story he is revealing himself to moses uh there on mount sinai so let's just start reading the exodus chapter 34 beginning at verse one and the lord said to moses cut two tablets of stone like the first ones and i'll write on these tablets the words that i were on the first tablets which you broke so be ready in the morning and come up in the morning to mount sinai and present yourself to me there on the top of the mountain and no man shall come up with you. Let no man be seen throughout all the mountain. Let neither flocks nor herds feed before this, that mountain. So he cut two tablets of stone like the first ones. Then Moses rose early in the morning and went up Mount Sinai as the Lord had commanded him. And he took in his hand the two tablets of stone. Now the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long suffering and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. So Moses made haste and bowed his head toward the earth and worshiped. Again, we'll just stop there. <clears throat> and if you're like me, uh, you can read a story like that that you've read um, you know, hundreds of times or have heard it hundreds of times. And uh, you can easily take for granted uh, 
what is actually happening, this real story that actually happened with Moses on Mount Sinai and God himself <laughs> coming down and revealing himself to, to Moses there, uh, which is simply amazing here. But we see that the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. So again, Moses is right in the midst of God himself. And we know that's happened to, that happened to Moses quite a few times as he was blessed to be in that um, situation where he actually uh, had God physically speaking to him and God was physically manifesting himself to Moses in various forms. At this point, he's coming in the cloud. And, and then it says, and the Lord passed before him and proclaimed. And when the Lord first spoke, he proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God. And it's my understanding that the main idea is conveyed by the Lord saying that the Lord and the Lord God is he's declaring who he is in his essence. He is the creator God, the one who spoke everything into existence. And he's also the self-existing God. Um, you know, when, when Moses, uh, when God spoke to Moses in the burning bush, he said, I am who I am. And, and he told Moses, you can tell the, the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. When, when he asked him, what, what should I say your name is? And that, that thought process of, of I am is just, again, that I am the self-existing God. And uh, <clears throat> when you really just think about that, you know, again, I've known that fact for a while. Oh, yeah, God's self-existing, right? He, he doesn't need anything to sustain him. But when you compare, again, with everything that we know on this earth, it's truly amazing. I mean, really amazing. I mean, I think um, really of everything we live in that functions here on this earth needs something else to sustain it. You know, currently I work at a uh, uh, road construction company and we have some pretty big equipment. And uh, that equipment, as powerful as it can be, uh, needs fuel to keep it going. Just needs that liquid that diesel going through it and um you know without that diesel getting put in that engine that piece of uh, iron is literally just a piece of iron just sitting there it's not doing anything it's not moving any dirt it's not uh paving a roadway i mean it's just a piece of iron it needs fuel to keep it going even our own selves you know we um we obviously need what food water rest <laughs> um uh sunlight air we need a lot i'm i'm you know uh science tells us how much we need to keep continuing to live we cannot just continue to survive on our own we are completely dependent on other resources on other people to keep um to keep ourselves alive i mean we all live in homes uh, I find it hard to believe that we built every single inch of our home all by ourselves, right? Uh, all of us, uh, you know, are so dependent upon other people. Probably, I'm sure the vehicles that all of us ride in were completely built by someone else, right? So uh, on a daily basis, we're reminded that we are just so finite and <laughs> we just, we, uh, we, we cannot self-exist. So to think that, the one true God is the one who is self-existing. Think about the power there. He is, I, this, all, this idea also just shows that he is the source of all life, that all life just flows through him. And he's the one that gives the energy, the power to everything else. He's the one that spoke creation into existence. And he is the one who keeps uh, our universe intact and keeps uh, the earth going around the sun and um and spinning on its axis and again just everything that we that we know of that is the one we're reading about this evening that's the one that we actually are privileged to have a real relationship with is the one who is the all creator god and the self-existent one and god uh displays himself in many ways of that and one of the things that god also wanted us to realize is that this one god the lord the lord god isn't just some type of force, isn't some, you know, just some higher being, but he's a real person, you know? Um, 
he he has a real character and um just like all of us all of us have bodies right we all look certain ways and um you know but if we were just bodies uh we couldn't go anywhere we would have no personality uh, that we would just be a lump of matter but that's not the way god made us god made us with the soul and spirit and gave us uh spoke life breathe, breathe life into us and um that and we understand based on genesis that we are in the image of god so we are unique in creation and our unique feature is the fact that we are in god's image but yet we are not God. We are far from God, right? The scriptures tell us that, that uh, every person just in and of themselves, when they're born in this world, they are separated from God. They are sinners. They are, um, uh, again, they, they miss the mark in terms of God's standards and are not God himself. They are not perfect like God. All of us, we've all done things that God would not do. We think thoughts that God would not think. We do actions that God would not do. And that shows that we are not him and that we need someone to save us from the sinful things that we do that are not like God. And that's when Jesus was sent to save us from our sins and trust that anyone who's listening to this does, that does not know that they need a savior even and that, and that does not know who Jesus is or what, why he came or what he's done that they, that you will trust him um, and find out who jesus is and was and 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 why he came to this earth but for this time right now um we just again want to think about jesus fulfilling what the lord god spoke there to moses back in exodus did jesus fulfill these things and there's so many stories we can go to uh we don't have the time to but we'll just look at a few that again proves that this man, Jesus, who lived about 2000 or so years ago, who walked this earth in Israel, in Jerusalem, that that man wasn't just a man, but was a real person. As we said, uh, he, God found a way to have um, God himself become a real human being. And that was God, the son. You know, there's God, the father, God, the son and God, the Holy Spirit. So in God's perfect plan, God, the son became a real man, but unlike any other man, as I was just referring to all other men, all other people who've ever lived have missed God's perfect mark. They've not been exactly like God. They haven't had the power that God has had, and they make bad choices that God wouldn't make. Uh, but Jesus was not like that. When you read the stories about him, he never made a bad choice. And as we're about to read, he had a lot of power. And still does have a lot of power, even though he's not physically present on this earth in bodily form at the moment. Uh, where he is right now, his presence is still um, infiltrating this world, uh, particularly through the spirit of God. Uh, but one day his body, he will come back in bodily form here to reign on this earth. But right now, again, we just want to think about Jesus and him fulfilling uh, a bit about what was mentioned there in Exodus 34. So if you want to turn to, uh, um, let's see, uh, Matthew chapter 8. I'll just look at a story here, Matthew chapter 8. And in a very famous passage, as I mentioned, Matthew 8 and verse 23. Now, when he, speaking of Jesus, got into a boat, his disciples followed him, and suddenly a great tempest arose on the sea, so that the boat was covered with the waves, but he was asleep. Then his disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us, we are perishing. But he said to them, Why are you fearful, O you of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. So the men marveled, saying, who can this be that even the winds and sea obey him? <laughs> Again, what a great story we're reading here is Lord Jesus was in a boat with his disciples, the closest people with him. And uh, we, we read about this great storm that just all of a sudden came. And uh, 
but Jesus was actually asleep um, in the boat. Again, showing that all he, although he was Almighty be God, he took on human flesh, and yet without sin, um, he still his uh, body there still needed to sleep, and he and he took a rest. And uh, and while he was sleeping, his disciples came and woke him up, saying, "Lord, save us! We are perishing." They thought they were going to die, man. I mean, again, these guys, if you read about disciples, many of them were fishermen. They knew a lot about life on the sea. Unlike me, I'm sure if any little thing would rise up, if I'd ever be out in the, in the ocean or on the sea, I'd be freaking out because uh, I wouldn't know what to do. But these guys, for them to get uh, so rattled by this um, great tempest that arose on the sea, uh, shows you that they were scared. They're very scared. So the fact that they woke Jesus up and they were saying, we are perishing. They actually thought in their minds they were preparing to die. And they wanted um, the Lord Jesus to save them in one way. They knew that there was something different about him and that he had the power to save if he so cho chose. So he woke up and said, why are you fearful, you a little faith? And he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. So the men marveled, saying, who can this be that even the winds and the sea obey him? Amazing. And when you think about in today's world, when, when we hear of a hurricane coming, uh, even in the year, what are we in, 2021 now, right? With all the technology we have in today's world, what do people do when a hurricane comes? Well, they do a couple things. They'll either flee from where they're at. If it's going to be real bad, they're going to flee where they're at, or they're going to go to some type of shelter that was built by people uh, to help protect them, right? But I have yet to see an option where people have the power to control the storm and get the storm to calm down, right? That's never happened in history. What do people have to do when a storm comes? They have to wait it out or get out of the storm's way, right? That's the only power that we have to do. But Jesus had the power to actually stop the storm itself. This is amazing. I mean, when you really think about it, it's absolutely amazing. And uh, again, we know it's true. It happened. And uh, we see, again, the Lord God, the, the, the eternal creator God, the self-existent one, had control of the storm and the winds, and the winds obeyed him. And again, we, as we saw there, the disciples were impressed. So... What else does the Lord say about himself? He says he's not just a self-existent God, but he's merciful. And what does it mean to be merciful? Well, a lot of times in scripture, merciful is simply uh, not giving someone what they deserve. One of the famous passages we can turn to for this to show the Lord Jesus and how he reacted is in um, John chapter 8. If we turn to John chapter 8, uh, we will see. Uh, an instance that the Lord Jesus was put in the midst of. And I'll begin reading in verse one. But when Jesus went to the Mount of Olives, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Now, early in the morning, he came again into the temple and all the people came to him and he sat down and taught them. Then the scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in, in the midst, they said to him, teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now, Moses, in the law, commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? This they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Then those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest even to the last, and Jesus was left alone. And the woman standing in the midst, when Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Again, here we, we have an instance where this woman uh, was caught in a very serious sin. You know, God takes adultery very seriously because he takes marriage very seriously. 
Uh, as you read anything about marriage in the scriptures, you see one of the main things about marriage is it is a picture of the Lord Jesus and his bride, the church, and God takes that very seriously. So anything that, uh, uh, you know, true marriage, marriage pictures, uh, God takes seriously. And adultery is when someone breaks uh, that, that marriage picture. And again, it very upsets God. It's a horrible sin. And as was mentioned in the Old Testament, someone was supposed to be stoned for that. And here, apparently, this woman was caught in the act. And people, the accusers threw her down there, getting ready to stone her. She deserved it. It wasn't that she didn't do it. It wasn't that she was treated unjustly. She deserved the punishment that comes with adultery. And as they got ready to stone her, the wisdom of the Lord Jesus, they, they threw him right in the midst of God himself, right? The Lord Jesus there. And they said to him, you know, as she was called in adultery, and he says, he was without sin among you. Let him throw a stone at her first. And he really got right to the heart of the issue, right? God is so wise. The Lord Jesus was and is so wise. He gets right to our hearts, what the core of an issue really is. And they, the people that were there, they were actually honest. <laughs> They realize, you know what? I'm, I'm guilty too. I am guilty too. I have, I have a lot of sins. It might not be the same exact sin as this woman in this instance, but they realized they had other sins and they couldn't justly condemn her. And they all left her. And what does the Lord Jesus do? He had the right to condemn her, right? I mean, the Lord Jesus was completely perfect. He would never do something like that. He had every right to condemn her. But although he did and could have uh, condemned her and stoned her and, and just have her cast off, he doesn't. He, he doesn't. He lets her go. And it wasn't that he let her go free. Uh, we read later on in the Gospels, the Lord paid for that sin that she committed. When he, when he died there on the cross of Calvary, uh, he was getting that stoning, if you will, uh, as he was being crucified there. But he let her go, showing his mercy to her. And again, he shows that he takes that sin seriously. He said, go and sin no more. He didn't think, he didn't just brush it under the rug like it was no big deal. It's a very big deal. But she didn't have to suffer the penalty of that sin. And that's, again, the good news about coming to the Lord Jesus. If you trust in him, you won't have to suffer the penalty of your sin. You might still have to suffer the consequences of your sin while you still live here on this earth to certain degrees. But if you know the Lord Jesus, eh, even those consequences are here are only temporary. When you get to be with the Lord in heaven, then all be removed. And, 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 and the sin issue had been dealt with on the cross by the Lord Jesus. And, uh, and that's what he was convincing her of. If you come to me, I'll take care of your sin burden, of the burden of sin and, and the penalty of sin. And uh, he lets her go away and had mercy on her. Again, proving true what he told back to Moses back there on the Mount Sinai. Then he goes on to say in Exodus 34 that he's gracious. What is gracious getting? Well, as we said, mercy is not getting what you deserve, and grace is getting something you don't deserve. And maybe for a story for that, we can turn right uh, to uh, the uh, uh, book of Luke in chapter 22, I believe. Uh, Luke 22. Again, so many stories we can turn to of the Lord showing his grace here, but uh, this one struck me recently. Luke chapter 22 and 47. While he was still speaking, the Lord Jesus, uh, behold, a multitude. Um, sorry. And while he was still speaking, behold, a multitude. And he who was called Judas, one of the twelve, went before him and drew near to Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said to him, Judas, are you betraying the son of man with a kiss? When those around him saw what was going to happen, they said to him, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. But Jesus answered and said, permit even this. And he touched his ear and healed him. Again, in the, in the book of John, it says this, was, this it was a servant of the high priest. And his name was Malchus. And we read there, too, it was uh, Peter <laughs> that cut off his ear. Again, crazy story. Here are these people are coming to actually arrest Jesus. Again, the one who has done nothing wrong was out, only trying to help people and uh, people that were really inspired by Satan and Satan's plan, which is really God's overall plan to come and deliver mankind. But in this instance, these people were coming to arrest Jesus, the enemies of Jesus. And in that, 
one of these uh, people here, the servant of the high priest, was coming to arrest Jesus, and Peter cuts off his ear, his actual ear. I mean, can you imagine that? I mean, that's <laughs> that's a big deal, having your ear cut off, right? And just the blood everywhere, the pain, that the fact that you might not be able to hear right anymore, the looks of it. I mean, what is this guy thinking? Like, I can't believe I just had my ear cut off. And then, then the very one that he's coming to arrest picks up the ear, puts it back. Again, showing you the power that he has. He had the power to heal like that. But what a story. What grace the Lord shows. That man did not deserve to have his ear put back, right? He was coming to arrest, arrest a perfectly just man. God himself, if you will, the one that was giving him the very breath to even have the energy to go to arrest Jesus. And he gets his ear cut off. And what does Jesus do? He puts it back and reminds the people there that God has a more of a perfect plan. And what grace, again, we see by the Lord Jesus himself. He's so quick to forgive, so quick to act gracious to those that don't deserve it. And again, maybe that sounds familiar to you. Maybe you're like me tonight and you're, you're thinking, man, you know, I've done so many things against the Lord. One of the main things I've done personally in my life against the Lord is not think about him. It's so caught up in my own life. I forget to be thankful for the things that he's given me and forget how big of a deal it is to know God himself and to share how big of a deal it is with others. And that's what the Lord's convicting me of, even through this message. I mean, I know a lot of times we get asked to do certain messages and I think, oh, it should be for the benefit of the audience. Well, every time I speak, I trust by the spirit of God, it's a benefit towards me. I'm preaching to myself here because I need to be reminded how excited I should be about stories like this where the Lord Jesus, he put an ear back on the person that cut off uh, of the person that was trying to arrest him. I mean, again, what grace, what kind of person is this? This is a person we need to make a big deal about because he's a very gracious person. That's God Almighty. Lord declaring himself. So he's merciful and gracious. He's long suffering. Well, if you still have the book of Luke open in chapter 22, you don't have to turn too far. We'll go look at chapter 23, beginning to verse 33. And I don't know if you can think of a better passage to show how long suffering the Lord Jesus is, other than looking at the crucifixion itself. Verse 33 of Luke 23. And when they had come to the place called Calvary, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And they divided his garments and cast lots. And the people stood looking on. But even the rulers with them sneered, saying, he saved others. Let him save himself if he is the Christ, the chosen of God. The soldiers also mocked him, coming and offering him sour wine and saying, if you are the Christ of, of the Jews, if, I'm sorry, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. And then inscription also was written over him in letters of Greek, Latin, and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. So again, we could go on reading there, but uh, what the Lord Jesus suffered there. I mean, talk about long suffering. I mean, the hours and agony was there, even leading up to the cross. His whole life, when he came to this earth, we know that he came to die the first time. So his entire life, he knew what was going to happen. He knew what God's perfect plan was. He knew, as he said in the, in the garden, uh, as he prayed to the Father, if, this, if, it, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. He knew the pain that was coming him. And now he's actually in the midst of this pain, it says, and they crucified him. It's a few simple words to say, but if you know anything about the Roman crucifixion, <laughs> it's no joke. I mean, obviously the people are going to end up dying the people that are crucified on the cross, but the agony on there, not only the agony, but the humility. I mean, he was being looked at as a criminal. Anybody that didn't know any better that was just simply passing by would assume that Jesus was a criminal. He was willing to be looked on as a criminal for you and for me. This is what God's like. This is what the true God's like. This is what Jesus showed himself to be like. God didn't just declare what he was like to Moses. He proved it all throughout history. And then particularly, especially when Jesus came to walk on this earth, he suffered and he, he just suffered at the hands of simple men. And we see it here. He's so long suffering for people like you and me. We deserve to die a death like that. And he, he bore our sins on the, on the tree. He became our substitute. That should have been us. By God's, by God's law and standards, we have broken it. And we read there's other two people there that were criminals and they were getting what they deserved. But then the Lord showed gracious to, the, to both of them too. They could have both turned to him. 
only one did and one was guaranteed to be with him in paradise but um but again the lord showed his graciousness to or his long suffering there and his graciousness and his mercy also there on the on the cross of calvary what a god he is and then it all it also goes on to say there in exodus that he's he's uh, abounding in goodness and truth right Bounded in goodness and truth. Well, we'll turn uh, also now to another famous passage back in Matthew, Matthew chapter 14. Uh, I'll begin reading in verse 15. It says, um, let's see, Matthew 14, not me. Matthew 14. Verse 15, when it was evening, his disciples came to him saying, this is a deserted place and the hour is already late. Send the multitudes away that they may go into the villages and buy themselves food. But Jesus said to them, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. And they said to him, we have here only five loaves and two fish. And he said, bring them here to me. Then he commanded the multitudes to sit down on the grass. And he took the five loaves and the two fish. And looking up to heaven, he blessed and bro broke and gave the loaves to the disciples, and the disciples gave to the multitudes. So they all ate and were filled, and they took up 12 baskets full of fragments that remained. Now those who had eaten were about 5,000 men besides women and children. Again, another amazing story that we know um, is spoken of throughout uh, um, the ages, really, or last couple of thousand years what jesus did he performed a miracle showing his power again taking the small portion of food that he had with the five loaves and two fish and, and fed a multitude with it five thousand more i heard there might have been up to about twelve thousand estimates say between the women and children uh and what did he do he didn't just perform a miracle but he he met the needs of people people came to hear the truth he said he's abounded in goodness and truth well they came to hear the truth that only he speaks that's who god is god is truth his word is truth, and he is truth. He's walking truth. Truth is reality. Truth is knowing everything that God is. He's the one that made everything in this in creation. He decides how things operate. So if we want to know the reality of how things operate in this universe and by his economy, it all he's the source of it all. That's why he's truth, right? So, um, so people came to hear that truth. They wanted to hear about what the true God of their Old Testament scriptures were like, and they wanted to see what Jesus was like. And he showed again his power. Like, you come to you come to me, man, I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you that I'm gonna provide for your needs. And if you're like me, you can attest that God, God has got a great track record of providing for our needs. And when he has when he makes the decision to take us all home to go to the glory that that's his prerogative to make he has a, a, a time designed for all of us to, to 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 turn and go with him in glory um but while we're still here on this earth he promises to provide for our needs he provides clothing and a place to live and and um and places to fellowship with other believers and uh you know again he's just such a good god abounding in goodness and truth and i've experienced it and that's why it's, again, great to do messages like this, because they're great reminders that God constantly provides for us. And these need to be daily reminders that we can share with other people how he's so good to us and takes care of us on a daily basis, even if we don't always recognize it or just get used to it or take it for granted. But again, here in this case, he provided actual for the actual needs of the people there that day, right at that moment, and did it in such a way that he, and he just used the resources that he had. And that, what an encouragement that is to us that, you know, the Lord, we can ask the Lord to help us as his servants to use the resources that we have to meet the needs of people. And maybe we encourage to do so. There's a lot of people in need and we are blessed to be his servants and to serve him in such a way that it puts a great taste in the mouth of others, which leads me to the next thought. The story found in First Kings. And it's really this story that has really struck me recently. Uh, again, another famous passage here that many people turn to as they think of Solomon particularly, but we know Solomon was also a type of Christ. And again, if you know Solomon, you realize that he was not a perfect by any stretch of the means. He had plenty of failures like his father, David, but the Lord still used him mightily. And Solomon wrote a good uh, portion of the Bible. But uh, first Kings chapter 10, we have a story about Solomon when someone came to visit him. 
the Queen of Sheba. And what does it say? First Kings 10, verse 1. Now when the Queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon concerning the name of the Lord, she came to test him with hard questions. She came to Jerusalem with a very great uh, routine, with camels that bore spices, very much gold and precious stones. And when she came to Solomon, she spoke with him about all that was in her heart. So Solomon answered all her questions. There was nothing so difficult for the king that he could not explain it to her. And when the queen of Sheba had seen all the wisdom of Solomon, the house that he had built, the food on his table, the seating of his servants, the service of his waiters, and their apparel, his cupbearers, and his entryway by which he went up to the house of the Lord, there was no more spirit in her. Then she said to the king, It was a true report which I heard in my own land about your words and your wisdom. However, I did not believe the words until I came and saw with my own eyes, and indeed the half was not told me. Your wisdom and prosperity exceed the fame of which I heard. Happy are your men, and happy are those these your servants who stand continually before you and hear your wisdom. Blessed be the Lord your God who delighted in you, setting you on the throne of Israel, because the Lord has loved Israel forever. Therefore, he made you king to do justice and righteousness. And I'll just stop there. But again, just think about that. The Queen of Sheba. Now think about this. Um, I'm, I've done a ton of research on the Queen of Sheba, but I'm sure she was fairly hard to impress because of her own position that she had in the world at that time. You know, uh, obviously, the, the more that someone has, particularly with possessions or just their uh, stature of a person or their reputation, whatever it might be, typically the harder it is to impress that person or even the age of someone. You know, the longer you live, the more you might experience certain things. And then after you experience certain things, you don't get quite as hyped as you do the first time you experience something. That's why it's need to be around young children a lot of times, as I'm blessed to be right now. And, and to watch them experience things for the first time. Uh, we got to take our little two-year-old sled uh, a little while ago because we had some snow recently. And just watching his face as he's going down the hill for the first time was just neat to watch. And it, him experience that for the first time. And, and uh or we just actually were blessed to get a, a newer vehicle recently and just watching both our daughter and our son's face light up when they saw this vehicle that they weren't used to being in. Just, it was like, you know, they're just so wild by it. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's like that with everything in life. You know, we all had those moments when we first experienced something like just, you know, it's, it's hard to get enough of. And uh, so again, this Queen of Sheba, she heard, of the fame of Solomon, what he was like, and she wanted to go check it out for himself. You know, like, can this can this really be real, right? Can this, come on. So she goes and checks it out, right? And she came prepared to ask hard questions. Like she, like, I'm sure she wanted to believe it, but she came like, all right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be prepared. Like, I'm gonna assume the worst. I'm gonna, I'm really gonna give all that I have. So she came with the hard questions. And after meeting him, you know, what did he say? He asked him these questions. And she spoke all that was in her heart too. Like she gave, she ended up like divulging everything to her, probably far beyond what she initially expected to Solomon. Uh, and uh, and it says uh, Solomon verse three answered all her questions. There was nothing so difficult for the king that he could not explain it to her. And uh, <laughs> and then it says going on verse four and five when she'd seen everything. What does it say at the end of verse five? And this is what really struck me recently. It says. Um, there was no more spirit in her. That's how it words it in my translation here. I mean, she was just like in awe. Think about that. I'm just Solomon. Solomon's not God. It's a picture of God, but he's not God. But even the way Solomon, the way God blessed Solomon with his wisdom and his possessions. I mean, he had it all. He had it all. And not just Solomon himself, not just the house he built, but what else was she impressed by? The people that served him. I mean, that got her attention, right? What's it say? Happy are your men and happy are your servants who stand continually before you and hear your wisdom. They loved being around his wisdom too, right? And that's what we should be. The Lord loves to give, show us his wisdom. That's what it says in Ephesians. He, uh, he wants to show us more of what he's like, of his thoughts. And the more we get to know of God's thoughts, and we're like, wow. 
I mean, maybe you've been a sort of blessed to be around uh, a bunch of wise uh, people. Um, I know uh, if any of you get to hang out with Crawford, you get uh, blessed with being around a, a wise person there. But uh, but yeah, you know, many uh, many of us do get to uh, uh, hopefully get to be around people that know the Lord very well and can inspire us to be closer with the Lord and grow in our grace and knowledge and wisdom of the Lord. Um, you know, I've seen that many times before. I remember, I won't mention any names here, but I remember uh, there was a, I would say, a fairly well-known speaker came to visit us some years ago and we were talking about another speaker and uh, this person that was staying with us, he was saying, you know, he had heard about this other speaker sometimes and heard about how, you know, uh, the gift that he had, how impressive it was. So he wanted to hear him speak one time and listen to him speak and thought, you know, it was a good message, but it wasn't enough to be wowed at. But I guess after that message, they had a time of like question and answer time and he was listening to this brother answer questions and that's when he got impressed like wow this person is a very wise person and the way that person answered questions and that's what this queen of sheba thought when she saw solomon like look at all that he has he's he's loaded he is rich he's got the best of everything and not only that his servants liked being around him i mean you know i'm sure there's plenty of, i've heard a lot of stories about a lot of rich people and they're not always the most enjoyable people to be around not solomon he was how about the lord jesus lord jesus is so rich yeah he became poor for your sake and he became so poor that people didn't realize his position because he was so poor and that's how he was able to connect with so many people because if he really showed his glory like he did the, the few on the mount of transfiguration they would be what they wouldn't be able to be in his presence but he veiled his glory, became as a, a human being born into a poor family and lived among poor people and reached the people to the heart of people. And that's what God's like. God's true. What he said about himself there on Mount Sinai to Moses, even so much more. And we see it all displayed in, in the Lord Jesus. You know, again, if you read the very last book, I mean, I'm sorry, the very last verse of uh, the book of John. Uh, I love how it says that. Um, John, um, 21, 25, and there are also many other things that Jesus did, which if they were written one by one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Amen. So again, we just say, phew, no one compares to Jesus. He is the man. He is the God. And he is the one that we really should be looking to. And, to, and, and if you're not, if you haven't been impressed by him, and sometimes I can go through stretches in life like this too, I, I stop getting impressed by who God is and who the Lord Jesus is and shame on me. But if you haven't been, go back to the word, ask the Lord to show, show you more of these stories, what he actually did. And then ask the Lord to start showing you these kind of stories in your life. He likes to show these kind of, likes to do these kind of things in your own life. Um, and so that you can share and be a good testimony to others. And may we ask the Lord to help us all. Those of us that know the Lord Jesus here, may we all ask that we might be blessed like Solomon to show people like the Queen of Sheba how great the Lord is and that they can enjoy, just like Solomon's servants, they can enjoy the Lord just like Solomon's servants did even more so. And that we can be happy just like they are, just resting in the Lord, trusting him. He's the one that's in control. We're just going along for the ride. We're just enjoying the missions and the, the opportunities the Lord sends us on in the meantime. And so again, but uh, one of the ways we can do that is going back to the character of God. God's just not just this all powerful self-existing one. He's the one that has a character that is merciful and gracious, long suffering, abounding in goodness and truth and keeping mercy for thousands and thousands. We can attest to that tonight. So again, I just trust all of you can be encouraged by some of these thoughts that you would seek the Lord out as you seek to want to be like Solomon servants and just enjoy the things that the Lord has given uh, and shown to us through his son, the Lord Jesus. Our Father, again, we just thank you so much for your goodness to us, that you uh, do care for us in so many ways. And we uh, just pray for, again, anyone that might be listening to this message, Lord, that you might help them to uh, seek you out more through your son, the Lord Jesus, that they might get into the gospels particularly and read the stories of what the Lord Jesus did while he was here on this earth, the words that he spoke, the people he reached, and the people he touched. And we know he touched, thank you that you touched my life and pray to touch so many more uh, and just help that gathering there at, um, uh, at up there in, in St. Catherine's, Lord. 
So uh, we, uh, again, just pray that um, you help us all to just to draw close to you each and every day for the remaining days that you give to us. And it's in your son's name that we pray and give thanks. We even thank you for the technology you've instituted today that um, even though uh, can't uh, be in certain places physically, you've allowed the message to still go forth. So we just thank you for that. And it's in your son's name we pray and give thanks to the Lord Jesus. Amen. So thank you again. Uh, again, I trust this will be a blessing to you. And uh, hopefully I can see many of you at some point in the future. Uh, and again, trust you all know the Lord. And if you don't, there's no reason to wait any longer and turn your eyes to him. And if you do know the Lord, and I don't am, and am not privileged again to see you here on this earth, I look forward to uh, spending all of eternity with you, uh, with the Lord Jesus himself. Thanks again.